when, uh, when Professor Hawaji first told me about this conference and about uh, whom he planned to invite here and what he planned to do, uh, my initial reaction was, uh, was wow, uh, what an amazing thing. And now that I see who is here, uh, I once again just want to say wow. Um, I am uh, very grateful to him for putting together uh, a, a really incredible conference. Uh, as I look around here and I see assembled uh, friends, former teachers, uh, former colleagues, uh, and people uh, whose names are well known to me and whom I never dreamed I would have the opportunity to meet. So uh, as chair of our philosophy department, it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you here. You did not come here to hear me speak, um, so I will just say a couple more words and then uh, I will get underway here. But before we move on, I do want to thank, uh, first of all, Professor Bawaji for uh, putting this marvelous conference together, to thank all of our distinguished guests for being here and for everyone who has uh, made the effort to come and join us for this marvelous event. I would also like to thank uh, our sponsors, the Department of Africana Studies, the Department of Political Science, the Black Students Union, Brooklyn College NAACP, the Delta Chi Chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. I would also like to thank the many supporters of this conference for helping to make it possible, including the Office of the Dean of the School of Humanities and Social Sciences, the Brooklyn College Office of Diversity and Equity Programs, the Institute for the Study of Race and Social Thought and the Center for Afro-Jewish Studies at Temple University, the Department of Philosophy at Northwestern University, the Coalition for the Preservation of Reggae, and the Drama Institute. So thanks to all for making this conference possible. I would like to now uh, invite my colleague, Professor George Cunningham of Aquilana Studies to come to the podium uh, and say a few words. Thank you. It will be a few words. My job is just to second the welcome to Brooklyn College to thank Professor Bouaji. And uh, when we first saw this conference, it wasn't wow, it was we can't afford this. <laughs> and it really was we can't afford this. And we didn't think we, we didn't think you could bring something like this to us, and in fact we did. So we are very, very pleased and very thankful for the caliber and the quality of people that you brought, for the caliber of discourse and the questions that you are asking. That's what we hope that Brooklyn College will do. And I think I've finished thanking you. And thank all of you for coming. And I am also extremely impressed by the number of co-sponsors, not at Brooklyn College, that's, that's normal, but the number of co-sponsors we've got from outside of the college. That is, again, a testament to your network, what you can do. And uh, so again, thank you. And thank you all for coming. Welcome to Brooklyn College. Um, good evening, uh, my very senior colleagues, uh, my own professors, you know, my teachers who are in the audience, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and especially my chair, you know, uh, Matthew Moore, he likes to make it seem as if it was my doing. But he was instrumental, you know, in, in instigating me to this. And for that, you know, I thank him. And for the support that he has given, you know, he, he seems to have so much energy. I keep saying it. Um, and he doesn't drink coffee. So, <laughs> yeah, so I think, uh, you know, thank you, Matthew. Um, then, uh, Professor Cunningham, thank you very much, you know, right from the very first meeting we had, you know, I felt very welcome, and um, I want to thank you. The departments that have uh, collaborated or conspired with me to make this happen, um, you know, political science, Professor Okome, she's quite very busy with, uh, you know, I want to thank you for making it easy for me to be at home. Uh, Department of um, Secondary Education, uh, Africana Studies, you know, and everybody at Brooklyn College uh, found it very nice 
you know, place where people well, can do my new things. Thank you for that. Um, then there are, you know, colleagues. Uh, Louis, Louis Gordon, where is he? Is this? Oh, yeah. Yes, you know, <laughs> he's a co conspirator. And uh, Charles Mills, you know, he is also a co conspirator. I want to thank you very much. Uh, the Drama Institute, uh, CPR, you know, who will be streaming tomorrow. I want to thank you. And for the very senior colleagues, you know, people have always admired right from undergraduate uh, days, who, you know, not only uh, found it possible at such short notice when the invitation was sent to accept. I know colleagues who, when you call them and say, can we do something, they will say, speak to my manager. And, um, you know, when they tell you to speak to their manager, that means, uh, you know, uh, a lot of uh, things happening there. But these are very senior colleagues who, in their, you know, in themselves, they are, they are institutions who have agreed to be here with us at such short notice. And, um, you know, um, I feel very, very humbled, you know, for, for your coming. And I thank you. Uh, especially for what you do and for the fact that you are able to continue to stimulate us into thinking. Um, Professor Florence, I can see you there, you know, that she's from the, the another cool conspirator, that's uh, from secondary education, she's the chair of secondary education, thanks for coming. Um, I wasn't going to say much in my task, as I agreed with uh, Matthew, was simply to call Professor Okume so that we can begin, you know, to get things going. Professor Okume, you are the chair for the next uh, session. <laughs> oh, let me, let me get I to shall that. go back and then <laughs> come okay. forward. <laughs> <laughs> well, forgive me, I just came back from Nigeria. Wow. Well, what Yesterday evening. So, um, a little jet lag. Um, welcome again to Brooklyn College. And it's my great pleasure to be here. When Professor Bewaji invited me to participate in this, um, in this conference, I told him I'm not a philosopher, and I'm not. I study political science. And so I felt that it was better to hear from real pros rather than myself. So it's my pleasure to introduce um, Professor Molefi uh, Ashanti of Temple University. But I want to say something because I went to Nigeria to give a talk. And part of my talk, I think maybe is a little related. Do you, would you permit me otherwise? We can just skip. All right, I'm the chair, so I'm taking liberties. Um, and this piece, um, I titled The Importance of Culture. It's part of a very long presentation. Language as part of the arsenal against colonialism. I think it might fit, right, in your point. And what I say is all politics is local. Thus, I want to begin at home. And I crave your indulgence to allow me to recall the Yoruba saying, Ile Latin Kesh charity begins at home. So I am Yoruba, and I'd like to use these days, now that all my publication stuff is done, and I'm having fun, <laughs> I'd like to use Yoruba products um, in my essays. And although I kind of refer to Yoruba heavily because that's my area of strength, I think there are similar sayings to what the Yoruba say in all African societies, and I even think in communities of African descent worldwide. So I think that my contribution to this philosophical debate or um, discussion is that Africans should see our proverbs and aphorisms as sources of our people's philosophical epistemology and a contribution to the world's pool of knowledge. Um, now, I, I also asked the question, how do we reconcile this saying with the glaring fact that contemporary Yoruba and Africans so blithely privilege colonial languages like I am? 
over their rich and amazing heritage. Some people would uh, consider it a cop-out, but I argue that one of the reasons is pragmatism. I know that is the success of colonialism as a system of domination, and we could also broaden that and say imperialism. And yet another is sheer carelessness and a lack of attentiveness to the politics of language. It's instructive that Ngugi says, quote, the present predicaments of Africa are often not a matter of personal choice. They arise from an historical situation. Their solutions are not so much a matter of personal decision as that of a fundamental social transformation of the structures of our society, starting with a real break with imperialism and its ruling allies. Imperialism and its compadre alliances in Africa can never develop the continent. And it goes on and on. I wouldn't really bore you, except if you want to hear more, but I doubt that you came here to hear me. You came here to hear um, Professor Molefi Kete Asante. And um, I'll try to give a brief introduction of him. Am I probably taking you that down the chair? So pretend I'm drinking water right now while I refer to my notes without my black berry. So please forgive me. Get black is a bad thing. <laughs> In the days past, your bus used to have something they called a break. <laughs> they would transport you from one spot to the, or to the other just by force of your intentionality. But it's now gone. You know. uh, if anybody knows how to recover it, please tell me. That would have, well, Malam over there knows, so he's going to tell you tomorrow, maybe today, if you ask him. So, um, Professor Molefi Kete Asante is a professor at the Department of African American Studies at Temple University. He is one of the most distinguished contemporary scholars, having published um, about 70 books. And um, he also is recognized as one of the 10 most widely cited African Americans. Um, I think I'm not going to take up too much of your time. You will find out why this is so when he gives the presentation himself. Um, so please join me in welcoming to Brooklyn College Professor Molefi Kete Ashanti, who's going to give us the presentation. Rejuvenating an African Discourse on Life, Piecing Together the Fabric of Family. Thank you very much. Hotel. 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 Uh, I'm so happy to see all of you here. I want to just say that uh, it's very good to be at work with the college. I can't even believe that I have never been at Brooklyn College. I was just telling uh, Dr. Nia Coco, who uh, graduated from here uh, and then got his PhD at Temple University with me, that boy, when you said you were from Brooklyn College, I didn't know it was such a nice college. I mean, it's a really nice, it's a serious college. <laughs> so I'm, I'm delighted. But, um, Dr. Koki is here, and so is uh, Dr. Ferreira, two of my PhD students. These days, when I travel around, since I've had about 140 PhD students, I always see somebody in the audience, and I just want to recognize them. I also want to thank Dr. Bowai. I uh, uh, met him uh, long before I met him, actually. I met him uh, with uh, his, his writings, and then I went to Jamaica with the Caribbean um, Philosophical Association uh, that was under the leadership of Dr. Lewis Gordon, one of my great friends and uh, compatriots uh, from Temple University. And, and, and I met uh, Dr. Bawaji. And uh, then the fact that he came here uh, to uh, Brooklyn College, that was wonderful. I, I just said, wow, he's going to be in our neighborhood. But, and perhaps sometimes he can even come and, and uh, speak for us down in Philadelphia. 
I want to thank Dr. Mike. That's more, I, you know, to have a chair that supports an activity like this is, is remarkable, and it's good. It shows you intellectual activity, it shows you a sense that uh, people are engaged in this process, and, and I, and I want to I wanna thank you. Uh, I also want to thank you for pushing that cart uh, <laughs> today uh, to bring over, bring over our food. That was very wonderful. I mean, I said, because, you know, we're all ordinary human beings. That, that, that's the thing. You know, most sometimes people think that they are not ordinary, but we're all human beings, and we all do these things, and we should do these things. Um, let me start my presentation by saying that <clears throat> any mature and deeply reflective account of contemporary cultural thinking will have to deal with three leading propositions. One, disciplinary decadence has proceeded, has proceeded in such a manner that it has brought with it the debris of its past locations. Two, the epistemicide witnessed by indigenous cultures and peoples is the great psychological terror of our times. And three, the resetting of centric places where people have familiar cultural grounding is one of the best ways to combat nihilism and anxiety. To me, there can be no rejuvenation of an African discourse on life until we are able to clear space for an African inquiry. To reverse the situation means to bring one situation to a halt, then it leads to a movement in a totally different direction. I have attempted to address these propositions by reading the literature and philosophy, Africana studies, and rhetoric. Perhaps the first two readings, philosophy and Africana studies, are understandable, given my work over the most of my career. But, at, and, but the last, rhetoric, must be understood in connection with my earlier works, where I wrote the book, The Rhetoric of Revolution. I wrote language, rhetoric, and communication in black America, and I wrote the rhetoric of black revolution. Three books published under my slave name, Arthur Smith, at the beginning of my professional career. I am as intrigued as you are that I have raised those books and the name of rhetoric as a discipline in this discourse, but it is because Professor Bawaji has laid out the theme of this conference in pretty precise terms that require some sort of rhetorical or linguistic analysis. We should not be surprised that those of us who are gathered here are the descendants of, that is, intellectual descendants of Du Bois, Sheikh Anta Joe, but also St. Clair Drake and Alain Locke. What we have on them, I believe, is a far wider reach into the past than they had to discover ideological similarities. We know now that the works of Cabral, Camus, Sartre, Fanon, Freire, Nascimento, and others have inspired our assault against the warlords of the culture wars. All discourse, like theory and criticism, must be considered historically and socially situated acts in terms of scholars who seek to discover the cause and the remedy for epistemicide, there are border crossers and border guards. Yet, some of us seek to rupture the terrorizing past, and others want to preserve traditions of resistance, but both want to trouble the waters of theorizing. In saying this, I am claiming that rhetoric is not opposed to philosophy, but it is now a form of philosophizing. That is, it is a philosophical enterprise. Kenneth Burke once argued that we were homo symbolicus, mm -hmm. beings of the symbol. But we are also homo resistors, creatures of resistance. The intersection between discourses on the individual and the society is the secret 
S U N crossroad of African rejuvenation. Herein lies one of the trickiest problems of contemporary philosophy and general Africological thought. This is a crux that has been probed by various African philosophers such as Kwame Jechi, Paul Mutonji, Lewis Gordon, Leonard Harris, uh, Tunde Bawaji, Charles Mills. I dare say that they have all formed opinions about the nature of African philosophy and have sought to plumb the lines to deal with what we have often called the overwhelming power of society on the African person. I've written about this term. I've rather written about this in terms of the person and society, uh, Afrocentric personalism. But it is not just my own thinking that has found its path uh, uh, to the brink of desperation brought on by my singular realization. I think I can now announce my conundrum, as James Baldwin would say. Since Western philosophy is preoccupied with the individual, and African society is well known for its insistence that the family, lineage, ancestors, and society define the person, we immediately see the clash between the individual and the society as a secret crutch. Where the Western philosopher wants to ask, am I a creature of fate or some uncontrolled force external to me? The African already knows the answer to this question. We know who we are by knowing to whom we are connected. This is why the old African-American hymn declares, let the circle be unbroken. But this does not satisfy the Western mind with an emphasis on the individual. Of course, it is not only individualism, or to put another way, a question of the individual for the sake of individuality that makes the Westerner a philosopher, but rather the search for individual freedom. One of the principal questions is to what degree is a human being free? One could ask it this way. One could say, is a human individual really free? Or is he or she determined by something external to themselves? Even if one is considered, uh, even if one is to consider these questions seriously, as they are profoundly important, then it is easy to see how we have to confront them in our search for African rejuvenation. We must, it seems to me, see the limits of individual freedom. We do not choose our race, our century of birth, or our parents. And consequently, we are subject to a fate or destiny that is out of our hands. There are so many impenetrable puzzles. It becomes impossible for us to answer why we are black or white, tall or short, male or female. Yet religion, always to me an inauthentic form of explanation, seeks to give an answer to all these questions. If you are wise, then you will know that there is no evidence for moral freedom. The sage philosophers, as Henry Oruka uh, called them, the, the Kenyan, uh, knew something about choices reflecting the established character of individuals, a character formed in the crucible of society and ancestors. Any choice outside of the socially defined character is considered capricious or perhaps immoral. Now, I have argued in previous Afrocentric works that Africans, after the enslavement and colonization, were reduced to objects in the thinking of Westerns. We were seen as discreet, detached, abstract, unemotional, precise things to be used, worked, cursed, abused, and killed if necessary. But we had to claim our agency. If we, if we, uh, if we were really. Um, if we were to be subjects, choosers, and not objects chosen by others, and we have found this, of course, extremely difficult. We live in a real world, not one that is detached and abstract, but one where I talk to my daughter, who has suffered with schizophrenia for 20 years, and I must be, as she is, engaged, involved, and alive in the midst of ambiguity. And all the time, choices must be made. I'm not alone in this regard. It is also your destiny. If I take the Western understanding alone, 
I can see where I am free and responsible for decisions that I make. I may be able to say in the West what my life should become, but this is not exactly true for everyone, but ultimately not even for me. It is impossible to know everything that I should know, and that is why in African philosophy one must consult with the experts. Lewis Gordon, a major contemporary philosopher and one of the great minds of our time, has written on existentialism in a way that demonstrates its relevance for Africans. He argues in one of his first books, Bad Faith and Anti-Black Racism, that bad faith, as articulated by Jean-Paul Sartre and sharpened by Gordon himself, is denial of human reality because it shows that one seeks to evade the human condition. He sees this as an escape, a better yet a choice against deciding to engage freedom. And hence one becomes a person that is a victim of unfreedom and a willing participant against choice. Gordon knows that this position privileges the idea of exclusion and promotes an assertion of one perspective only. Bad faith. Faith is therefore lying about one's lying or rejecting any authentic conversations about reality. He tells us that what we need is critical good faith based on a respect for evidence and accountability in the social world. This form of thinking is quite close to what I have come to know about African ways of being. The language is different because Gordon was schooled in the preeminent manner of most Western trained philosophers. The Yoruba, on the other hand, have other ways of expressing similar concepts. That is why I have said that existentialism's emphasis on freedom and decision sits in the corner of the new house of African thinking. To say I exist in freedom can only be meaningful if we know what the consequences of our choices will be. And how will we know this unless we are living in the context of a socially constructed world? Excuse me if I suggest that Gordon unintentionally criticizes Sartre for something that is quite useful for African rejuvenation. After a brilliant exposition of four reasons for questioning Sartre's essay in Black Orpheus, Gordon writes of a fifth reason, saying Sartre's main purpose in writing this uh, famous uh, prefatory essay was to situate black cultures as authentic foundations for black liberation. If Sartre got anything right, he got that part correct. All persecuted and enslaved, brutalized and discriminated people, whether blacks or Jews, Dinka or Nubian, Palestinians or Armenians, must find the secret of their liberation in their cultural reality. The African world does not allow us to go around claiming that we only know that we exist. Perhaps humans can only believe and not know because there are no real avenues to knowledge outside of our existence. We take the leap of faith into belief and never really approach knowledge. This is the opening for African philosophy because now we see that the leap of faith is no different from our reverence for our ancestors. I do not make a passionate appeal for some systematic form of knowledge. To acquire knowledge, I may utilize passion but it is not necessary. One sometimes knows or learns something, even if one would usually be disinterested. If I am born into Oshobo or Oyo society, uh, there are some things that I will learn and know simply because they are part of the universe and my reality. I do not have to use the passion of the neophyte, the new convert, the fanatic, because I acquire information and knowledge by virtue of my own ancestral legacies. These are the graces of birth. What kills me, that is, what causes my world to fall apart is the terror of loss, cultural loss. To understand this, one must know that the only way we hold on to reality is through the memorabilia of culture. We need the markers that stir recollection and association in order to gain our footing. Otherwise, the loss of memory that might happen in a temporary sense, given a sudden change of place or experience, might tend to be permanent. 
In a postmodern twist, one might claim that the markets may be made by any society, and one could be socialized into any culture, and this claim could be substantiated in fact. However, in the African context, where most Africans dwell, it is the assertion of African culture that makes its case for our sanity. We are challenged in this space by the pro provocative nature of epistemicide and psychological terror ingrained in the European ideology of domination. Karen Bennett is correct in her article, Epistemicide, the Tale of a Predatory Discourse. But she identifies the new European rationalist paradigm as an instrument of liberation from the feudal mindset in Europe. The problem is that this system that emerged almost parallel to the European slave trade became the prestige approach to knowledge for Westerners and their victims. Its association with the slave trade, with shipping companies, with insurance agencies, with colonial enterprises, in Africa and Asia made it the calling card for those whites wishing to play in the modern world. The rationalist format was the only <coughs> format for the advancement of a human being. Predatory discourse gobbles up all other discourses and spits them out as if they were the creations of the predators. If I may make a digression, the apology was correct. One runs quick to African culture to examine what a Mahdian ethics would demand in such a case. Now, allow me to comment on a recent spate in the political uh, sphere. Predatory discourse seeks to change the terms of our engagement with knowledge and our fellows. Take the case where President Barack Obama apologized to the Afghan people for the unintentional burning of the Koran by American soldiers. Republican candidates, all white males, suggested that it was a mistake at all. The key to Mott is harmony, order, balance, supported by righteousness, justice, truth, reciprocity, the holding back of chaos. This is an ethical issue since Mott is a source of and direction of all action in the ancient African world. How do we hold back chaos? This is the fundamental social question for African society. Before this digression, I was talking about predatory discourse, gobbling up other discourses, especially those of Africans. The problem for us, African people, is not merely the fact that predatory discourse was positivist when it first occurred, or that it privileged the rich while minimizing the interactive and interpersonal basis of human experiences for us. On the receiving end of this marauding cultural view, we are, we are made passive and inert to be seen, but never to be heard. In effect, this imperialistic worldview rendered Africans invisible and of course obliterated our knowledge to all extent possible. Such epistemicidal assaults gained force in every sector of human knowledge and made our challenge to its authority look like the pleadings of beggars. I would not have to argue for a rejuvenation of an African discourse on life had we been left alone, and had European ideological imperialism not manifested itself so violently against African cultural thought and knowledge. The Yoruba have a proverb that says in translation, the butterfly that brushes against thorns would tear its wings. All decisions are contextual, and all decisions have consequences. To establish the foundations upon which black people can stand, we need to reset locations of agency. This is where the intersection of philosophy with politics, ethics with rhetoric, and practice uh, with theory meet in common purpose. When I wrote Afrocentricity in the Theory of Social Change in 1980, I had not studied much philosophy, sociology, or anthropology. But I had sat at the feet of the great historians at the University of California, Los Angeles, and knew from the work of Gary Nash, Ronald Takaki, and Boniface Obichere that the pursuit of history was the pursuit of memory. 
What had occurred to me in the cold Buffalo winter of 1977, the year of the Great Visit, and the year of Festac in Lagos, was a psychological dislocation of black people from every part of the world. The only common experience of all of these black people from Africa, South America, North America, the Caribbean, and Europe, was a physical abuse and psychological terror promoted by European domination. We were off of our own terms. The Yoruba in Brazil had to claim Virgin Mary as Yamanya in order to prevent the authorities from outlawing the religion of the people. Blacks in Brazil made Capoeira a special dance form rather than the martial art form it was in Angola. Thus, dislocation created by cultural side was a prelude to epistemicide. What Europe could not destroy in the movement of Africans from the African homelands and our dislocation to the Americas and Europe, they would finish with the denial that Africa had philosophers and, of course, the denial of African philosophy. Resetting the cultural agenda is the only avenue I see for rejuvenating the African epistemic. My point is always to begin with the earliest African approaches to knowledge in the Nile Valley because it provides us with the clearest records long before the contamination that entered European thinking with the slave trade. I am not so naive to think that there was something pure about the earliest thinking done in the Nile Valley and other parts of Africa. I, I'm, a, I'm a realist to the point of knowing that human beings are animals and make bad choices as other animals often do. It just seems that our choices have far greater consequences given our greater capacity to destroy. Quite frankly, how much destruction can the cow or the bear or the horse or the chicken or the gorilla or the elephant really bring to the earth? The case is closed. Human beings are the most destructive of all animals, and we have seen this in forms of mass murders, serial killings, Holocaust, mass extermination, wanton lynching, and butchery of all kinds, past and present. So I'm not saying that prior to the European slave trade or Arab slave trade before that time, that Africa was pure, unspoiled, and without blemish. Kemet went through four golden eras before Greece went through one. The first, initiated by Imhotep, was a pyramid age, around 2800 BC. Africans built uh, the highest and most massive monuments in the ancient world. The second golden period was ushered in by Mentehotep I, around 2010 BCE, and led by his heirs, Antef I and Antef II and Mentehotep II, the Great. During that time, Kemet was reunited and the temples were restored, the cities rebuilt, and the Nile River secured from raiders and enemies. The third golden period came in 1500 BCE, when the famous 18th dynasty, the most prominent family of kings and queens to rule any country, beginning with the Camosian Revolution that gave us the names like Amenhotep I and Amenhotep III and Hatshepsut and Tutmosis III, and the great Akhenaten and Tutankhamun, and the royal wife Queen Tai. Egypt reached its most favorable height during this period. Education of the priests grew, scribes recorded everything, and some like Amenhotep, the son of Hapu, is reputed to have known nearly everything that was possible to know. Thutmosis III conquered the known world and led his army on 17 war campaigns, a feat never repeated in human history, and then built a hall to honor the ancestors. The fourth golden period was inaugurated around 720 BCE by Taharka, who came from the south, following Pianchi from Nubia to the Mediterranean, transforming Kemet by restoring the altars, reopening the libraries, and copying the ancient manuscripts, supported by the Sabbaths, wisdom teachers, who gave and wrote Sebiak, wisdom teachings, <coughs> philosophy in the Greek language, long before Greeks had a language. The leaders who created human civilization along the Nile realized the necessity for rational thinking. They were essentially without peer for a long period of human history. Buddha, the Indian philosopher, 
was born in 560 BCE. And Socrates, the Greek philosopher, was born 100 years later in 469 BCE. Thus, when the Nile Valley civilizations, Nubia and Kemet, were flourishing, there were no philosophers anywhere that compared to the knowledge of their philosophy. To obliterate ancient Africa is to truncate, no, to, to obfuscate African thinking and to cheapen subsequent wisdom from the ancestors in other parts of the continent. No one knows what Socrates really looked like when he was philosophizing, and who is to say what Buddha wore on his body when he was reflecting on the mysteries of the universe. I'm saying this because of the tendency pounded into the minds of Africans that even that a philosopher has to look a certain way, be dressed a certain way, have a long beard, and have a certain literary record. Well, the European philosophers, those who created the system of Orisha and divination, were men and women of expert knowledge based upon long years of observation and experiences. They knew human beings by studying their characters and watching their behaviors from birth to death. No philosopher uh, has ever been more expert at observing the human being than the African village philosopher who took uh, subjects uh, as, uh, as a professor would his or her students in a class for 70 or 80 years. I mean, can you imagine having the same class for 70 or 80 years? You would definitely know something about your students. If you studied their characters for that long, divination would work every time. You would know precisely what sacrifices would have to be made to make the person com commit to her or his decisions. And they would be perfect. You would know exactly how to do it. These wise people who sat alongside the Oshun River were as brilliant, as studious, as expert as the best professors of today. They have at their disposal far more human material than we have when we make our own reflections. I think you see that I insist on rejuvenation starting with the African civilization. I do not insist, I do not think, rather, that we study Africa enough. In fact, many of us have abandoned our ancient traditions because we find it too demanding. Yet, at the same time, we continue to build upon the traditions of the West, adopting the ancestors of the West as our own, and, co and, and confining or condemning our own best traditions to the downhill of history. I know how deeply the West has struck into our hearts. UCLA, I can assure you, was no less demanding of our attention than Brooklyn College or City College or Yale, Harvard or Temple. But as my friend Claude Alvarez has written in his book, The Blinded Eye, 500 Years of Columbus, pulling out these institutions by the roots must cause great pain. But there is no compelling reason why these fundamental tasks must remain undone. I do not know. I do not now see, brother, how Africa can be rejuvenated without purging itself of the Columbus that is with all of us. The African diaspora does not escape the same predicament. Yet it must be clear that Africans will never attain freedom if we are in a world where we are nothing more than parents. Why should African intellectuals not find the way out of the confusing and uh, hegemonic wilderness created by Europe? In 1999, a few European ministers of government created what they call the Bologna Process in Bologna, Italy. It was to be an attempt to internationalize the influence of Europe in education. 46 nations signed on to this document. While it is not necessary to criticize internationalism or expansionism, we must recognize when the goals are not clearly in the interest of African rejuvenation. Africa will be more marginalized in its intellectual expansion. This document was based on the Magna Charta Universitatum, an earlier document which also speaks of the European dimension being expanded throughout the world.
So we see the idea of hegemony is not through with us. But can it be that we have finally asked the question that will wake us up to the reality of the prison we are in? A rejuvenated Africa must be a prime task of African philosophers, or else the rejuvenation itself will become the battlefield for politics and economics without the guiding influence of philosophy. The fact that our notions of fairness, poverty, beauty, governance, and even justice tend to be based uh, tend to be based on European ideals means that we are victimized by the legacies of enslavement and colonization. Breaking that legacy will open the door to our own traditions and cultural values and the entire structure of our societies. Africa will rise again, but it will only rise if we are able to discover new icons of knowledge, new places of sacred reverence, new syllabi uh, uh, for our classes that privilege African and Asian scholars as well as the best European thinkers. We learn from everyone. And we must remember that there's nothing more correct for Africans than our own historical experiences. The falsified histories of African people must be challenged and replaced. The mental enslavement that lurks in our hearts and in our minds must be exercised, and we must regain the honor of our own cultures. In sum, our objective has been to find ways to reverse the process of cultural aging among Africans. We have to shed whatever mental enslavement or commitment we have, have uh, made to aping Western styles of knowledge and exhaust our own ways of seeing in order to shake off the process of aging. I try to check historical accuracy, moral grounds, and philosophical uh, legitimacy of your centric frameworks as a way to fly above the blowback debris of a crippling system. I think a rejuvenated Africa could then be compared to civilizations in Asia and Europe on its own terms. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that comment and, and question. Uh, let, me, let me just say that uh, the, the idea in, in my paper uh, regarding uh, existentialism uh, was not so much that the individual himself or herself saw himself or herself and decided as a victim. Uh, however, one could argue that uh, even with existentialists, uh, you can, of course, victimize others, because my decision may very well victimize you, even though it is something that was freely done on my own part. My own uh, uh, characterization of this uh, is essentially uh, based on the idea that in the African concept, where you contextualize human activity by virtue of uh, society, that even if I as a person act independently, or think I act independently, I am in a sense formed by my own context, by my own society. Uh, and I may be formed by that context even without reflection. It may be something uh, that has occurred to me, um, or that has happened to me, by virtue of the fact that I am born in Oshogono, uh, which I had nothing to do with. I didn't make a decision to be born in Oshogono. But I am born in Oshogono, so therefore I know that Iwa Pele is the critical component in Yoruba philosophy. That good character is itself the basis of things, even though I, did, I did, had nothing to do with making that decision. So that's the only point that I was making. I was not, my, my only um, uh, point, and this was really to support uh, some of the notions that Professor um, Gordon mentioned, of course, in, in, in the Bad Faith. And I just think that sometimes we have to uh, uh, look at that and see that, that, that people really try to escape the fact of their own uh, participation in the bad faith idea.
you, you could add to that, Malefe, that, um, that there is existentialism. That's Professor Boyd, by the way. There is existentialism beyond Heidegger. <laughs> and and, and there's, there are many reasons why I reject Heidegger. Well, I think your characterization. This is, this is said by the leading black existentialist sitting in the audience. I mean, and, um, and so there may be a good discussion between you. I mean, um, and, and in fact, the, 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 the existence uh, beyond Heidegger, one of the things I think that people ought to, ought to read is certainly the, 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 the later works by uh, Professor Gordon. Uh, you know, I mean, I think that Faith was written in 1995, but he's written many, many uh, books since that time um, about uh, existentialist ideas. Yes. Yes, please. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. It has been, uh, it's always a great, great pleasure and a lesson to, to have the privilege to hear what you want to get something. I really do have a question about, and I, I'm not a philosopher, uh, but I'd like to, to know how, how, how do you see the ability of the colonized subject who has been de denied full humanity to exercise free choice in good faith? Thank Why would you ask such a hard question? Thank you very much. But it's not a hard question. Oh, it's a good question. I'm sorry. I'm Anna. Anna, it's easier. Because everything else is very easy. Thank you. 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 Very proud. <laughs> no, actually, Michigan. Okay, thank you. Well, I, I think it is very difficult. I mean, uh, no one uh, can say that it is easy for the person who has been victimized to arise out of that victimization and then somehow fulfill his or her mission uh, as if it did not happen. I mean, we are all uh, caught up in this context, and yet. Because the um, individual uh, can uh, make a choice, we, we do make choices. Now, of course, you must be given some markers that will help you to identify what choices are possible, what choices uh, occur. Let me see if I can make this uh, clearer. I mean, I grew up in Georgia, in southern Georgia in a town called Valdosta, and then I grew up, finished uh, elementary and high school in Tennessee, Nashville, Tennessee. I know you know Georgia very well, right? <laughs> and if you grew up in Valdosta in the 1950s, you understand, my God, there you go, right? So, 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 so I grew up in that environment, and growing up in that environment, uh, I remember that there were very limited choices for me. And just take one thing. I mean, you, I told you my slave name was Arthur Smith. But now I'm Malefic Asante since 1973. So what do I do when I decide to change my name? I go to my father in Valdosta, Georgia, and I say to my father, look, you know what? For historical and psychological purposes, I'm going to change my name. What do you think about it? And I was Arthur Smith Jr. <laughs> and my father says this to me. This is an answer to your question, and I'm not gotten away from that. He said to me, this is in terms of decisions. He said, if I had known an African name when you were born, I would have given you one and I would have changed my name. Now, in this context of Valdosta, Georgia, African people, black people, had no access, at least at that time, they didn't think they had any access to what an African name would be. They, they only knew the slave name and the slave history. But, but I had received more information, more knowledge, and so forth. And so I said, you know, I want to identify with a struggle in South Africa. So I'm going to choose a Suto name, Molefe, one who keeps the tradition, like the Suto people in Southern Africa. But, but I can do that because I know this name. 
I can make an individual choice and a decision, which I could not have made if I had never heard. So I think context is important. So you, but you're, you're very right, uh, Dr. Ferrer, in order to rise above this victimization, we have to have more choices, more possibilities, and then we can, we can decide. And we may decide, for example, we may decide to be slaves. That's a decision too. People make that decision every day. You, 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 you may decide, I like, I am comfortable with this. I've had people to tell me things like that. You know, I'm, I, I, I'm comfortable. I can't, I can't change now. You know? And, yet you, and, and so these are people who have to. You can turn out all the possibilities. And they reject the possibilities. You, see. you know, there are, I mean, I think so there is a degree of freedom in trying to explore all possibilities. And, and I like to think that I try them all. You know, show me a possibility. <laughs> you know, let me, let me go down and have been do there's no such thing as a real African. <laughs> I think there's a thing, I mean, we, we can speak in a conceptual sense of African people, but there are varieties of African people. They're Yoruba, but they're also Zulu. I mean, so who is a real one? Uh, or is it the Shona? Or the, the Jamaican? Or is it the Haitian? I mean, who, who is this real African? Uh, I, I think that... Um, when we, when we speak of uh, Africa, we are talking uh, about a, um, a, a, there's something, an expression that I use um, and was criticized for, um, and, and I like the criticism because it was done by Henry Gates, and I like that, because it certainly was way off. But uh, this, was the notion of, uh, this was the notion of the composite African. If you read Afrocentricity, you, you saw this notion. Because, because I, I knew that this would come up, because the scientist talks about Africa. Well, who is the African? And I said in Afrocentricity that this is a composite term. This is a concept. It's a, no, there's no, you, you can't uh, uh, speak about a uh, real, to speak about a real African is like in the 19th century when the Europeans spoke about the true Negro. Mm -hmm. You know, were these true Negroes? Like, who are these? Who are these false Negroes? I mean, where is this true Negro thing coming from? You see, there's the images in the people's minds. And there's no such thing. I mean, in a sense, I mean, when we, uh, uh, I, I think that, uh, that, that certainly uh, you, you must speak of, uh, of historical uh, context and experiences, but you also must speak of, uh, of I think, a certain a contemporary sense of, uh, 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 of biology. I, I do think that that's a, that's a reality, but I think that that's a complicated one. But I, but I certainly think that when you start talking about uh, who are African people, uh, I wouldn't go to China, for example, to look for African people. You know what I'm saying? So, so there's a biological reality here. But, but there are historical experiences, and yet in, in China, I am sure I can find some Chinese people who have lived in Africa all their lives and who are pretty much culturally African. I mean, you can find those kinds of uh, phenomena. I mean, since we find, certainly we find in the United States of America, African people who are European. In every reality, from name to religion to clothes to everything. So you, you can live in a culture and all of a sudden, you know, you you, you have that. So um, I think that uh, if you're talking about uh, uh, what are African philosophical concepts, we can talk about that. That's something I can talk about. You know, we can talk about what are some of those realities. What are African languages? We can talk about that. Uh, you know, uh, what goes for uh, African uh, uh, commonalities? We can talk about some of that. I mean, late. Late weaning of children exists almost all over the African world. Uh, concept of ancestral reverence exists almost uh, all over the, the African world. Burial of the dead rather than cremation happens almost all over the African world. 
Uh, there, there are lots of commonalities of African people, but to speak of um, of a real African, I think real, real, real that's real difficult for us. James first. Yeah. Um, I'm Sharon Brown, and I'm from the Mona campus of the University of West Indies. And the usual disclaimer, I am not a philosopher. <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm merely an attorney. No, but um, I'm, uh, in the context of what we're talking about, what is a real African, just some thoughts that occurred to me. Um, somewhat like Obama, I, um, what one of my daughters described as an African-European-Asian Indian, um, that then gives you a complexity of choice. And I'm just briefly going to say that when I was going off to live in Nigeria with my then husband, my grandfather, who was Scottish, to tell you about the misconceptions and so on, said, I'm never going to see you again, they're going to eat you. <laughs> <laughs> this is gospel truth, I'm not making this up. Then we got to Nigeria, and I am who I am, and my then husband is still six foot three, and uh, his mother is full Indian and his father is white. So we arrive in Africa and we're quite confused because we ourselves had a certain concept. And uh, I was asked if I was Egyptian. And nobody thought I was from Jamaica. And then somebody thought I was Igbo. And then we went east and they thought he was Kenyan. And so it went. But I, my whole concept is that sometimes we are confused in terms of which one of the various multiplicity of cultures that we should embrace. It is because, in a very real sense, we are very, not very, some of us, we have all this multiplicity of choice. That's all I'm saying. Uh, may, may I, I just want to comment on that by saying this, that it is true that there is a multiplicity of choices, but human beings are human beings and we tend to live in culture. So I don't think it's a matter of choice sometimes. I always ask the person this, uh, because I, you, you do get African Americans who say things like, well, you know, I'm, I'm part Cherokee. I'm, I'm part Irish, I'm part whatever, right? But I ask one question, what culture do you live in? Do you live as a Cherokee? Do you live as an Irish person? So, so in the case, yeah, yeah you, you, we have, this, the, com the complication may be biological, but they are not necessarily complications of how people live. African Americans tend to live African American culture. They like they they do the music, they do the whatever the the the, the, the historical experiences, the Carnegie Woodson, the Harriet Tubman. That's the culture people live in. That's who you are. Your identity. That's that's your That's the cultural track you're on. So I, I think now you can be confused and say you know yeah on many levels uh, I, I don't real I don't I, I try to live all these cultures simultaneously then I think you have real psychological issues that's the, that's the that's the problem it's a fun it's a deep problem I I had a student who came to me. He, 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 was, um, he was Korean and African. And he came to me and he said, you know, what I learned very early on when I was growing up as a teenager was that I had to make a choice. And he says, I'm black. And this solved all my problems. You, you, you cannot, this is why, and I want to take this, why is this good? Give me a chance to do one of my favorite things. This is why I disagree totally with Du Bois's notion of double consciousness. And I've written about that. It does not exist. It cannot exist. You only have one consciousness at a time. 
You may have a confused consciousness, but you can't have double consciousness. I don't, this is a not, a, that's not a practical reality for a human being. And I, I wrote about that 20 years ago. That this is a this is a misleading thing. I mean, it came up really, I think, because of the post postmodern notions of uh, fluidity of cultures. People thought that boy, we really Du Bois was already ahead of his time. He talked about double consciousness. No, that's confusion. You can only have one consciousness at a time. And if you are English or German or French or white American, you have that, that consciousness. And if you have some confusion there, it's certainly not two or three consciousness. That doesn't exist. Are African people the only people who have this double consciousness? I, I didn't have it. Growing up in Valdosta, Georgia, I never had double consciousness. I knew I was black. It was quite clear. I had no, there was no confusion. I didn't even want to, I mean, there was no struggle between me and some other consciousness. I was a black person, living in a society in which black people were dominated. That's the way it was, you see. Now, now, let me say this about Du Bois. Maybe living in Massachusetts, he had a different experience. Maybe he had a desire to be white. That caused the issue with him. You see what I'm saying? I had no such issue. So I think that living in Nigeria uh, with multiple uh, biological backgrounds, really what it comes to is, is, is actually how you live. When I, I lived in Zimbabwe, when I lived in Zimbabwe, nobody thought that I was other than African, because that's the way I live. I'm an African person, I'm in Zimbabwe. My wife lived in Africa with me, in Zimbabwe with me. We lived as African people. That was our experience. Now, what, what, where we were from? I said, we are Africans from the United States of America. You know what I'm saying? So, so you, we are Africans from the United States of America because there are, a, as I said, a variety of African people in places. You have Africans who from Paris. You know, so 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 where you from is not necessarily, or at least where you are domiciled is not necessarily who you are in terms of your experiences or your culture. I mean, you can still be uh, Portuguese in, uh, in Michigan. <laughs> Hi, good evening. My name is Sharon Gordon, and uh, thank you so much for all that you've said. I'm scribbling and taking notes. Speaking on the confusion, um, I do a lot of work in reggae music and around reggae music, and I'm confronted and confounded daily by this confusion, and I'm trying to understand. I try. I am understanding as I speak to different people, how to navigate and help them to understand. In Jamaica, and, and this is where I think the problem is, and I hope I'm not offending any Jamaicans in the room, but in Jamaica, they have chosen a motto that says, out of many, one people. So you have people walking around really believing that. And so during the time of the early, the late 60s, early 70s, when the music was directing our path, i.e. Bob Marley, Jimmy Cliff, uh, Peter Tosh, we understood Burning Spear that we were that we were who we were. We were clear who we were. What happened though is when that shift occurred in the 80s, when this this new um, administration came in that decided we can't have these folks thinking they're Africans and they're revolutionary and what have you, they, they squashed it. And what I'm seeing now is one of our leading um, practitioners of dancehall is a person who bleaches his skin and is causing now an entire generation to think that it's cool to, I'm sorry, bleach your skin. And then, uh, you're, you're with me, right? And then I see younger and younger girls now, I was just in Jamaica, and I don't think this is unique to Jamaica, it's just that this is where I'm, I'm at. Young girls at school, they all have long extension braids in, and everybody flashes. I watch them, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I watch them just imitating and flashing. 
And I pointed out to my friend, and he says, oh, Sharon, stop. But then he watches for a minute, and he sees what I'm saying. And so, Professor, help me, because I'm challenged in the work I do. I'm, I'm, I want to know, how can I get people to understand that they're confused? <laughs> Wait, you're doing the same work I do. <laughs> I, I like that very much. Um, uh, I, I, you know, this is a this is the that's what I was talking about in my paper. I said that we find this extremely difficult because we really don't understand, I think, generally, what has happened to us in the Western world. We really don't understand. We we have we we have we have we some of us wake up and then we go back to sleep. But it's very difficult. It's a very difficult process. Whether we will win it or not, I don't know. But we have to try. Um, I was in Jamaica in the 1990s. I went with a delegation from here. Julius Garvey. Marcus Garvey's son, Gil Noble, Adelaide Sanford, myself, and a couple of other people flew to Kingston to talk to the Minister of Education about Afrocentric education in Jamaica. And he sat us down and he said to us, Jamaica is a multicultural system. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, the people who went with us, most of them, like Julius Garvey, Gil Noble, these are all Jamaicans. Right. He said, the country is at least 85 or 90 percent black. I mean, 95. What, what, 95. Huh? 95. 95. Well, we saw 85. We, at the time, that's what we said. 95 percent black. So, well, what is this multicultural thing that you're promoting here? He showed us the textbook. The textbook started. Jamaican history only with the independence from England. There's no way that a child going to school in Jamaica would ever know that they came from Africa. This is a, you don't start there. You start with you start with the independence. As if people dropped out of the sky in Jamaica, there is no emphasis at all on the origin of the Jamaican. So my wife is uh, 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 Costa Rican, uh, who came from Jamaica. Her people came from Jamaica, went, left Jamaica, and went to Costa Rica. And she always, this phenomenon always is very strange to her, because she takes the position that Jamaica is a citizenship. It's a nationality. It is not the origin of the people. The people must know where they came from. And this is not just true in Jamaica, it's also true in Brooklyn, among African Americans in Brooklyn and Harlem. The same phenom this phenomenon exists throughout the African world in the diaspora. And I think that what we have to do, we have to, we have to reinvigorate our own rhetoric with the notion that there is nothing wrong with being an African. I have always said, and I'll, I'll say this to this audience, other people have heard me say it over and over again, that the, uh, I said about African Americans, people whom I know most, <coughs> the fundamental crisis in the African American community is a cultural crisis. African Americans do not like being Africans. Yep. Yeah, that's it. Let me say it again, because you, you, you don't understand the implications of this. The African American children do not like being African. They're not being black, but not being identified with Africa, because what this society has done is a damnable criminal activity. It is to actually demonize Africa in the minds of black people. Yep. So we hate Africa. And you say I'm an African, that's a fighting word to somebody. Even though you see me 
as an African, that becomes a problem. So part of our task is to reinvigorate rhetoric and teaching and working with parents and children about Africa itself. I'm back. I'm just a student here. And my name is Michael Howell. And um, I'm a transfer student. So you guys are all like scholars and stuff. So we're students. Don't forget about us. Honestly, <laughs> <laughs> from the bottom of my heart, I'm from about three stops away at Kings County Hospital. And um, what you're saying, like right now it's Friday. Like some of my friends wanted to go out. But I'm here listening to you, and I am so happy I made that choice. <laughs> so, I feel like, you know, where they talk, like, how, like, I don't know, like, was it in the Bible where, like, the crumbs, they fall from the table? I feel like I'm just getting all these crumbs. And, and the knowledge that you're giving, I promise you, is being reached. Thank you. Thank Good evening, my name is Zoe Tedezia, I'm with the DDP Watch Group. I am honored once again to be in your presence and in the illustrious presence of all of you. Um, I fully agree with you that we do need to reinvigorate uh, African, our Africanness, our Africanity. Um, we need to embrace who we are and privilege, uh, but learn to understand that it is in fact a privilege to be of African descent. Um, my, my concern however, is that you know, we've been talking about Jamaica the last few minutes, and so I'm hearing Mali, and I'm hearing Exodus people. Mm. We are an Exodus people, people who are constantly on the move. And to that end, that makes us transnational beings. As our transnationality translates itself into a kind of fluidity. And the fluidity of our being, of our essence, of our Africanness, um, has to do with um, uh, being able to put together these disparate elements um, that make us who and what we, we are. Um, I, I, I hope during the course of this discussion we can unpack this notion of transnationality um, and how we formulate, reformulate uh, our identities because our, our identities are also in a constant state of flux. Culture is, um, is not a static entity. It's, it's constantly evolving, it's constantly changing. So, um, we can, in the course of the next couple of days, think about that and how the various philosophies that we unpack, that we, we invent, are informing those sensibilities. Uh, something else I bring in. Thank you. Yeah, my, my comment, I just want to say that that is absolutely correct. The thing is that uh, culture is, is always dynamic, and, and African culture is dynamic as well, I mean, everywhere. It, it is changing, and, and, and there are many uh, connotations on it. It goes on and on. Uh, and not only that, but uh, uh, what we have to do, I, I think, and what we uh, must do is always uh, to reinvest it uh, with, uh, with content. But here's the warning to this. There's something that, uh, and I, 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 I take it that uh, there are other people who are going to talk about that later on in this conference, so, uh, so I won't, won't reveal everything, but, but there, is a, there is certainly this notion of a, sort of a liberal multiculturalism, but I always say that if African people have nothing to bring to the table, then we are at the table, but with nothing. Let me put it another way. If, if, if it happens that, that, that we no longer speak of our own ancestors, that we have adopted all the ancestors of Europe, when we sit at the table of multiculturalism, what do we bring? i tell you why this strikes me. A 15-year-old young lady uh, who heard me speak, came to me and she, you know what she said? She said, Dr. Asante, I really appreciate your speech because 
I was at a Girl Scout, it's like Jamboree or something like this. She's an African American girl. And she said, um, they had all of us to get up and to say something about our cultures, our cultures. You know, to get up, say, so what's your uh, background, your nationality? Well, I'm Irish, and you know, so the person got up and said something about the Irish culture. You know, my background is uh, Greek, and they talked about Greek culture, Italian culture, English culture, German culture, all of them. She's the only black girl there. She said, when it came to me, Dr. Masanti, I cried. Mm. I had nothing to say. They had said everything. I couldn't think of anything from my culture. Because her culture had been their culture. They, they took their stuff, but when it came to her, she knew nothing of her own culture and history. She had nothing to add to the table. I don't want to be that person. I will always be able to talk about the Orishas and Ashura. Uh, I am always, I'm always, it's a great day. And also Harriet and Fannie Lou Hamer. This is extremely important yeah. that they have something. And this is true with the young people in Jamaica. They must have something other than British history. <clears throat> if you only talk about British history, what do you have to bring to the table of humanity? See? So we must be at it. Thank you. It's a very good question she's asking, but you know what? Um, you, she, you, 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 I think you, you continue. You must continue. I mean, you know, it, um, you, you will always find some people. Uh, but uh, it is a very... The destruction of the mind is a profound thing. It, it, it is really a profound what happens to us in terms of our consciousness. Um, I'll tell you uh, uh, that... You, I mean, I applaud you, and I want to say that you have to continue to do that, uh, to, to, to express you know, uh, this African culture. Uh, um, I remember, I will tell you this, this story. I remember when, uh, in 1980, when I decided that I would never wear a tie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I would never wear a, a Edward, King Edward tie or a Windsor knot. I just I am I'm finished with with England ties and stuff, right? And even with Italian suits. Somebody said to me, "But you can't do that. If you do that." People won't like you. <laughs> people won't do this for you. They won't do I have had no problem with people liking me or other people doing anything to me since I made that decision. You know what I'm saying? So, so I think in our minds sometimes, that's why I'm saying you, you got to continue to, to fight. Because they will say that. You will have people saying, you can't do this and you do, I won't do this. But the greatest thing that happened, I think, to support Africa and to support the African culture, may very well then that the first uh, black president of the United States of America, the first person to be president <coughs> of the United States of America, who was black, kept his African name. Do you know how important that is? And Muslim name. Muslim name. <laughs> well, the first part, certainly. But, 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 but Obama, his name was Obama. You know what black people used to say to me when I used to tell them about, you know, your name you got is a slave name. They said, man, if I change my name, it'll hurt my career. President of the United States of America has an African name, Obama. Didn't hurt his career. So, so, so but, 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 but the depth of the destruction in the minds of black people is that they feel that I, I got to hold on to this. This, 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 this slave image. Because if I don't, I will lose something. 
you won't lose anything. You will gain, just like I've gained. Don't, don't worry about it. Do, be yourself. Live your culture. 